Here is part two of my conversation with Dr. Tracy Herrick. Right, it, it's it, it's been pretty interesting. Just uh, uh, again, as a, a layperson who who got thrust into this world uh, very much against my will, uh, when the the world of of singers came crashing down because the news news articles in May of 2020 of just like singing is the most dangerous thing you do. Every time you open your mouth to sing, you're basically shooting machine gun bullets at people's face. That was that was essentially the the way that the news covered our our profession, um, and so got thrown into it in that way and started immersing myself. Not because I thought I could become an expert, but because when I had these conversations, I wanted to not sound like a moron, um, and started coming across just some of the general terms that you probably take for granted as an epi- epidemiologist of the ways you describe diseases, the way you describe health issues, and very much like you explained very well a minute ago, you've got to explain it in these big big picture terms. Uh, You don't, epidemiologists, at least prior to the pandemic, didn't seem to use terms like can or could, like kids can die or people can die, because that again implies that the risk is not zero. They they would use terms like, uh, at what rate do do they die? Um, and, And right now, I almost, I see people in your profession very much uh, taking a different stance than you are taking, which is to to use nebulous terms like can and could, uh, and because it can happen, we should, you know, right? Because all... you can't be wrong if you say it can happen, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. like, well, yes, it could, it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. how often? Yeah. And one of the first ones, one of the first ones I noticed, and I, I want to see if you've ever noticed this, and I and I just I'm interested in your theory. The first one I noticed very clearly about a year ago was. I learned the difference between case fatality rate and infection fatality rate. I had never heard those terms before May of or March of 2020. And I I'm, I'm going on and reading, you know, Mayo clinics website. I'm going world and data, you know, had a definition. I'm, I'm like coming up with these like a concept. Oh, okay. So case fatality rate is going to be a higher number because it's your confirmed cases. And then you divide the number of deaths that that gives you a term. And that's really valuable for healthcare workers because they know that if that person shows up at their doorstep with that disease, they've already, you know, they're sick and they, it gives them a a concept of how, what is the the danger here, but infection fatality rate has to, uh, you know, uh, estimate from the broader population who's actually had this disease. And these were correct me if I'm wrong, totally normal numbers to use and calculate in epidemiology prior to the pandemic. Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Not, not controversial terms. Yeah. Not controversial terms yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. and, but one of the things that, I, that you've, we keep hearing is we keep hearing people will say, you know, this, you know, this virus has like a 0.6% mortality rate. And then you'll hear, hear people in your profession, public health people turn around and say that that's misinformation. And then, and then I will see them very clearly calculate for people on the internet case fatality rate. So in other words, somebody will come and say, um, I'm going to give you what I, I think is the infection fatality rate. And then a public health person, I've seen this 10 times now, will respond back with no, 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 no. And they won't even mention that it's that, that there's a discrepancy in terms. They'll just give case fatality rate. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah, no, I, I mean, it proves the point that obviously you can use numbers to fit your narrative, uh-huh. right? But but it's also like, you know, well, why why are we, you know, why are we assuming that people are either good or bad? I think this is what I want to get to. Like, why why are we looking for certain words to figure out whether or not we like or dislike a person? Like, I just feel like we should be actually looking for information, you know, yes. and and <laughs> and it's really disturbing to me the way that people are kind of like so lazy that they they don't seem to read what people are actually saying, but they look for certain phrases or certain, you know, uses of, you know, words. And then they say, oh, wrong team. Um, <laughs> and I, I just think it's so sad. And I just. I just wish that people listening to this, you know, would kind of think about that and whether or not we really, you know, all human beings are on two different sides. Like, does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. We all, we all want the best thing for kids. We all want the best thing for all of us, you know? Right. So uh, I, I think that, 
for me, having spent a, a lot of my adult life in Europe, I'm used to multi-party political systems and discussions that involve many sides um, and open discussions, you know, and and I, I'm seeing that disappearing in the United States right now. Um, it's it's very concerning because how can you discuss ideas and trade-offs and you know different sides of a problem if you if you're immediately shut down just because you use a word like right. I have you like infection fatality rate or phrase or whatever like it's very dangerous yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it is no it absolutely is and and you know i don't remember if this came up in november when you're on with me before i know i've talked about it on the show before but the way i've processed all of this of course my the thing i care about i, I mentioned this before where everybody kind of has a, a thing about covid that they really are passionate about because it's what's touched their own life yeah. for me i work with teenagers and so I see the, the data on how COVID affects teenagers all the way from severe disease to hospitalization to death. And I see data from authoritative sources, the WHO, CDC, uh, you know, and dozens others peer reviewed studies at this point of what, uh, of what that looks like for them. And I do math in my head. And I also have in the last year uh, had, I won't say how many, but several of my own students attempt suicide, start uh, start uh, psych meds for the first time in their life because they are c- completely feeling despair and hopelessness. That that scares me more than COVID does for those kids because I know and I because I've also been affected in my teaching career with a successful suicide attempt from one of my close students. The, the infection or the case fatality rate of a successful suicide is 100%. Yeah. And so what I, what frustrates me with this dialogue is that when someone hears me talk about how I'm more concerned about these school disruptions for kids than I am about COVID that because of the team thing you mentioned before they hear, well, then you, you don't care about kids who die about die of COVID. But at the same time, I would never turn around to, to, to you and say, well, I guess you don't care about suicide. <laughs> I know. Why Why can't we care about both? I mean, well, care about well, both. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, I, I don't know that 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 narrative about the suicides is just it's very, you know, I, I don't know. It's very bizarre because it's like, well, the, we're seeing it borne out in the 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 data, the epidemiological data that they're they're actually we are seeing higher rates of it. We're definitely seeing higher rates of depression and mental health admissions. Um, and so, you know, I I just don't feel like um, you know there, if there's a higher there is a higher chance of a child, a, any given child, dying of suicide than there is from COVID, right? Yeah. And so so we should be paying attention to preventing suicides we shouldn't like not be doing anything to you know prevent suicide so if we if we're concerned about that you know we need to address that and that doesn't mean that we stop caring about kids who could potentially die of covid but you know comparatively the risk of suicide in kids is is higher you know of, of, in terms of death so yeah, I don't know. That shouldn't be controversial, but it probably will be. But <laughs> no, it, I, it's re, it's remarkable. I mean, there are a lot of things that are that are, are pose a higher risk to kids than COVID. I mean, there are right. a lot a lot of things. And and if we're going to follow these rhetorical rules, I could yell at anybody on Twitter for not caring and if, if kids die of cancer because they haven't. I haven't seen you tweet about child cancer in the last day. Like what what <laughs> like what 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 are we doing to each other instead? we should, uh, I would think, assume that the other person might care about a different aspect of what's going on right now than I do, because they have different life experiences in the last year and a half that I do that, like that would be that's my assumption. But I think we are, we've forgotten how to do that. Right. And I want to I want to give a quick, like extreme example Mm -hmm. of like our inability to do basically like a harm benefit or risk benefit analysis with this. So like, there was this, I, I've been looking a lot into youth sports and I'm really interested in studying it. And, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I do sports, uh, and, and, uh, medicine and see kids who play sports and my kids are in sports. So anyway, I, uh, so there was a study over the summer, 90,000 kids playing soccer, youth sports, 
Um, and there was one case of COVID transmission that was attributed to the soccer practices of all 90,000 kids. Now this was outdoors, right? This was last summer. And even after that study came out, like it was still, you know, they were still closing down all youth sports in, in California for the entire fall. And there are so many mental and physical health benefits to youth sports. And the fact that we, they weren't even allowing them outdoors was just like, you know, how, how can we possibly be so off on this risk benefit analysis that if COVID is like the least likely situation to spread COVID is, is, you know, being outside, you know, with, with kids who, and who are low risk and we're not even letting them do that. And we're putting them in higher risk situations. But it can, it can <laughs> happen. <laughs> right? It so, can happen. But, but that's the other thing that people forget is when you tell people they can't do something, then they are doing something else. So that's right. the other thing that we got wrong with, with the schools is like, you know, well, if a kid is not in school, a lot of times they're in a daycare, they're being passed around among caretakers. And so I, I, I don't know, it, a lot of it seemed just about appearances and whoever the, the dominant political forces were making the decision who didn't, who weren't willing to take that one particular risk and not about overall societal benefit or health. I think, in fact, I think you just you just cracked the entire pandem- pandemic. Just that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think I think what you did was you're you're pointing out something I noticed. I just haven't articulated it in that way, which is that everyone who gets to make a decision, whether it be a school board, to a county commissioner, to a local health department, to a governor, to the president of the United States, the entire time has essentially been pushing the risk out of their field into other people's field. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I mean, the most extreme example is like, you know, the uh, upper class, you know, who get to sit in their, you know, nice homes every day doing doing their Zoom meetings and ordering to go food and pushing the risk on, you know, the the working class essential workers. I mean, yeah, I don't know that that's that's not a good functioning society that does that. It has to be about everyone's well being. So yeah. So I had uh, I had Amish Adalj on the show in May May of 2020. It's actually pretty remarkable. I've gone back and listened to that show uh, since, and how much he got right. Uh, e- even in May of 2020, he had infection fatality rate right around a half a percent o- o- overall. Um, he had. Uh, the the idea that, that that COVID already at that point in his mind was endemic, it wasn't going to go away like like ever, um, and and then there were all types of just kind of thing. Of course, he's a legit you know expert in this area, and it was pretty remarkable. And and I got so much pushback from audience members about talking about the statistics and the, and the data in that way. And it's actually interesting because you tagged me in a in a thread on Twitter the other day. Uh, where a lot of the same type of just bizarre conversations ensued, where it in some in some people's mind when they hear you say things like uh, about 0.1 percent of kids who get COVID will go to the hospital, in some people's minds they hear so you're saying it doesn't matter. Oh where, right, yes. Where, okay. where does that come yeah. from? Why why do okay, people so think that's, that way? That's actually a, a really good point. So I think. That's that's an issue with, you know, uh, being an epidemiologist or working in epidemiology is you look at, you know, overall population health and o- overall numbers. And so you kind of like, you know, have to look at the look at the big picture. And that, you know, that doesn't mean that an individual person's experience is not important, but you're looking at things like societal trade offs and benefits and like, you know, you know, the entire world doesn't need to change the way it does everything, you know, because of, you know, uh, something that is extremely rarely affecting people, you know, it's, it's, it's all about like, what, what is the cost of that, that trade off, right? So, you know, how much, how many people are negatively impacted, and how many people are positively impacted, impacted. And so, you know, I think sometimes, you know, it does come off like, you know, that I'm, I'm minimizing or people are minimizing the, you know, when, when bad things happen, but, but that's, you know, certainly not my goal, or I think any, you know, epidemiologist goal or any physician's goal, who's trying to look at, you know, um, harm reduction um, and how can we, you know, harm the least amount of people and benefit the most amount of people. Um, And so there's always these, these trade-offs, you know, and I certainly, 
um, you know, have friends with like immune compromised children, children who are high risk. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've also said is if, you know, it's important to actually define which kids are high risk so that, you know, when, you know, if they're available for the vaccine, they can get it. So, you know, that, that we, that, that we are, you know, identifying the people that, that, that need it and, and recognize that. And, you know, but, but it's not like all schools need to close, you know, because of a situation with a, with a few children. I mean, I, I hope that comes off, you know, in a caring way because, I really do care about individuals, uh, you know, and I care about the overall population yeah. health as well. Yeah. And I, I feel the same way. I care about the kids that are affected by COVID, but I also care about the kids who are affected by what we do to prevent COVID. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. It's a, it's a trolley problem. Right. I mean, in the beginning, when we were saying like, oh, you know, their kids are going to get depressed and kids are, you know, going to have anxiety or other problems being alone. And even in the beginning, I thought, oh, well, it's just a it's just a few weeks. Like I was even one of the people who was like, kids, kids are resilient. <laughs> but of course, I, 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 I didn't think that it was going to be going on for over a year. And I mean, you know, now it's like I, I I've said this so many times. It's it's unclear to anyone what, what the end game of all of this is, you know, especially if we feel like vaccinations are not totally preventing infections, they're preventing, you know, severe illness. Like, are we going to forever be chasing cases and closing schools and masking kids? And like, what, what is the, what is the end of all this? So, you know, that's interesting because that's actually another thing that was on the top of my head of when Dr. Adalja was on making predictions with me in May was that he said, even if, if they make a vaccine, it won't prevent all the infections. COVID is not, you know, is not going to ever go away. Yeah. Um, and, exactly. and people still, people still don't get that. They, they think, right. that, they think that we're just, we're buckling down. We're, we're trying to do this one more thing until, until we squash COVID into zero. And, and it's just, that's a fantasy as far as I understand it. I mean that, yeah, I, you know, obviously I'm not an infectious disease doctor. I'm not a vaccinologist, but just, just yesterday I was reading the new England journal of medicine paper about the Moderna vaccines in children. And they estimated the efficacy of the vaccine in preventing infection to be 55.7%. You know, that was, it was very effective at preventing symptomatic disease, but not infections. So right. You know, I I think that we just need to realize that you know it, it, this game is it, it's never going to end if we keep trying to just test for for infections and and we should really be focusing on like preventing severe disease. Right, because as long as we continue to hold as our standard that these all these mit these mitigation factors and all these risk reducers are justified, as long as the risk isn't zero. Yeah. <laughs> then we then then we will be doing these things forever, and I think that that is the place that we're in right now in a lot of play, people's minds, and and that's partly I think the danger, the rhetorical danger of of why some some people feel threatened to hear conversations like this, or they they feel threatened to hear figures like you know a point zero zero one if percent ifr for kids or a point one percent hospitalization rate for kids. They hear that is so close to zero. Right. Uh, that 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 almost goes in kind of on that uh, like that sacred territory of well we're trying to get to zero and and the problem is you introduce the vaccines and that that re reduces the risk even closer to zero but it's never going to be zero uh, it's yeah. almost like it's I don't know if you've ever come across this there's like a philosophical or mathematical thought experiment where uh, you know if I tell you go go one mile away from me. Uh, and every time, and we each get to move, but each time we only get to move half the distance towards each other, you know, in, in theory, we will never reach each other, no matter, no matter how many steps. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is a good way to, uh, to introduce calculus. I mean, or that, that's a, that's actually, that's a good, good example. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. And it's like, you know, we, we take risks all the time in life. And I feel like people have lost touch with the sense of like, how risky it is relatively for kids to go in a car versus their risk of COVID. You know, I mean, uh, there in, in all age groups of kids, uh, you know, it's much riskier to ride in a car than it is 
for them to get COVID. I mean, the the it, according to the UK data, the the risk of death from COVID is is was six per million infections. So they found two per million overall kids, but they've had a third who've been infected. So. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm just kind of like reiterating what you're saying that I, I, I do, I do worry that, that there are some things that we take risks for without thinking about it because we say, well, this is just normal life. And there's this disconnect between our willingness to just take a small, this small amount of risk just to restore normalcy and to have a normal life. So I, you know, I think people really need to think about and this is something I think about a lot, like what, what is the value of a, of a normal life, you know, for a kid, for a normal school experience, for normal sports, like for, I, you know, for someone to just kind of sit down and, and, and list or think about all of these benefits that you get from seeing, you know, someone smile from, you know, having a discussion with your, teacher without anything like getting in the way and you know from being just being able to go play 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 basketball you know with (laughs) I I don't know there's so many things that I I worry like that the value of them is not being appreciated um yeah I mean yeah yeah and of course early on in the pandemic it was reasonable for some people to hear arguments like what you just made and say well yes but what's the cost of a life Right. And they'd say, okay, so the cost of somebody doesn't get to see someone smile at school. Okay. That boohoo, but th- there are people dying. Right. And, and of course now what I feel like we should be able to do is I, I'll use the term mature uh, the conversation. We can make the conversation more mature now where we recognize that yes, people are dying, uh, but isn't it also good? Well, first of all, there is no good that comes from a global pandemic per se, but isn't it a positive or a silver lining that we could look and say, well, look at how much more we know now than we did a year and a half ago about how to, to predict with very statistical near certainty who is highly at risk from dying and how to protect them, what situations to put them in, uh, so that we could potentially talk about how, those, the, uh, how we could free up those kids to be able to have the normal life that they need in order for their neurological development, which is not just which is not just fluff. Uh, right. there, there is the once, once a kid's brain is fully formed, that ship has sailed. You can't yeah. go, you can't go back and acquire language skills and acquire social emotional skills and acquire the ability to trust adults, yeah. uh, which are, which is harder for young kids when they can't see facial expression. Well, These, exactly. Yeah. I was just reading a literature review on that actually, that was great. That was talking about all the data that we have about not being able to, you know, have proper emotional development if you're not able to, you know, look at people's faces. And I was going back and reading my literature about the, you know, blind children and and language development about how that's behind, not the kids who are wearing a mask are blind, but, you know, we obviously use visual cues in a lot of things that we do. But, you know, beyond just masks, I mean, you know, that's obviously the hot issue right now, but like the long-term implications of, you know, not having normal sports or PE, you know, and sitting uh, in in your home alone during the day and developing, you know, obesity and diabetes at a young age, like that, that can also lead to death that leads to premature death, right? Yeah, and puts Um, you more at risk from COVID. Is is that not important? Right. And suicide risk from anxiety and depression. I mean, uh, you know, those are also deaths. And, you know, the, the longer we continue to postpone, you know, returning to to normalcy and restricting what kids are doing, you know, we're, we're, we are taking chances and the, the diabetes rates in the United States already increased. Oh my gosh, what was it? I don't want to say the exact percent. I feel like it was a third last year, according to a poster. Yeah. Well, I want, I'd like to try to squeeze one psych more segment out of you. If, if it's okay, Tracy, um, I would like to get your take on the C, the recent CDC update in masking guidance for the country. And in particular, uh, I, uh, I wanted to hear what you think about why, any, whether it be theories or if you actually know, uh, why of all the things in the country that happen on a day-to-day basis, the CDC felt it was very necessary in July to specify schools in that guidance. Is there data that suggests that they had 
that suggests that school should be singled out and not churches, not grocery stores, not uh, meat packing plants, not other things, but they named schools as a very specific place everyone should mask. That seemed odd to me. Well, that does seem odd to me too. Um, and I, I do not know why they did it, although I do know that um, there have been a number of studies done in schools um, where the fact that kids were masking um, has somehow become synonymous with, well, that must be the reason that there was such little COVID spread in the schools. Mm. So I was, you know, obviously the senior author of one of those studies, the Wood County, Wisconsin study, where, you know, we had over 90 percent masking compliance and we reported that. And that was you know, what was done in the districts that we were studying. Now, we didn't have a control group, obviously. We didn't have a group of unmasked kids. We couldn't say anything about what the effect of the masks were. But there was also the Duke, North Carolina study that came out around the same time. There was the Salt Lake City study. There were a bunch of school studies in the United States that came came out um, last winter that all kind of talked about masking and talked about the low rate of spread that we saw in schools. And, you know, in a... uh, in a non-logical way, um, decision makers, policy makers looking at these studies decided that it must be the masks. But of course, we don't know if it was the masks because being a Scandinavian, I know that they never mask kids under 12 and they also had low spread in schools there. So I, I we, we don't, so, so the, the answer is, I don't know. I, I think that they singled out schools because partly because of those studies. It could partly because be because of teachers unions. I know that um, teachers unions have been very involved in, you know, the CDC's decision making around what sort of policies uh, schools should have when they reopen. And that's, you know, uh, controversial as it should be, um, because, you know, I think there should be lots of different groups at the table, including scientists and physicians discussing what the best policies should be. But, but, But this is a long answer to your question that I don't, other than that, I don't know why they would single out schools because, um, you know, obviously other indoor situations with, uh, especially I would say unvaccinated adults, like that's where you would want to take the most precautions now, right. you know. And that, and that was what, that was partly what was puzzling to me because I knew that teachers by and large have to be at a very high percentage of vaccination by this point. Yeah, um, exactly. And now it, it would be shocking. Like it would be shocking to me if, uh, at least in my school district, if we were under 90% vaccinated. Uh, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so that seems like kids, we talked earlier how low risk they are uh, to, uh, and then we've got all these vaccinated adults and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even before the vaccine, the school masked or unmasked schools from around the r- world, uh, secondary attack rate or attack rates in general in schools are quite a bit lower than the general population, or at least let, let me let, let me rephrase that: not the general population, but other other types of settings like meat packing plants, like care homes, like these other types of congregate living places. You'd think that if they're going to single out a high danger zone, it would be one of the high danger zones. Right. Exactly. So. So yeah, ex- so schools have in general masks or no masks. There's been a secondary attack rate consistently of less than one percent. Right. Um, so so that that is very low, and I you know there there could be many reasons for that, but I I certainly think that one of them is symptom screening, um, and that you know people without symptoms, at least according to a very good study done in JAMA, they had a zero point seven percent secondary attack rate. So if you're you're if you're asymptomatic, you're unlikely to spread it mask or not, because that was in that was in their own homes. Yeah, that's uh, another big, that's a big misconception. Have you felt that too? A lot of the general I, I definitely I definitely felt that. And this is, you know, this is a disease with like a high K, right? So high dispersion. So there are super spreaders. And this we continue to see this with the Delta, just as we previously saw it, that there'll be a person who for whatever reason, you know, it's as far as I've seen, I've never seen a child that that was a super spreader, though. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but it's an it's a, it's an adult and there'll be a large outbreak. Typically, it'll be in an indoor setting. And then it's like, you know, that that can be enough to set a whole community on on fire with with cases, basically, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, so it it's it's not surprising to me that schools, as long as kids aren't symptomatic that their secondary attack rate masks or not is, is very low. Yeah. 
Yeah. One of the things that, of course, I'll, I'll bring the, the music world back into this. We, uh, in our professional organization, we sponsored, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, um, the, the professional singing organizations and teachers of singing organizations pooled our money together with University of Colorado and hired some of the, sci- the aerosol scientists there to do a very large study on uh, the way that aerosol particles operate in a room. And it was actually a pretty groundbreaking study. Uh, now, the problem, my criticism of our world is that we now, because we were musicians and we sponsored this fancy study, that it, for many of my colleagues, that's the only study they look at. Uh, wow. and, and so it's, uh, it's, and the way I joke about it is that, okay, great, we know how split, spit flies around the room, but what we don't know is how that affects real people in real situations and whether or not it makes them sick. Um, right, because, exactly. Because so that's the, the concept yeah. of the infectious dose, you know, or uh-huh. around uh, estimated to be around a thousand virions from what I understand. So you need a certain amount to to infect you. And of course, it depends on how robust your immune system is. And All right, they're averages. Uh, right. What did mm-hmm. you say? They're averages. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you're exactly right. You don't know if just because there's some viral particles in the air, if they're going to infect anyone, you, right. you don't. And, yeah. and I was, am I correct? So I was just describing an aerosol study is similar to how they've been studying masks, which is that they're, they're mechanistic, mechanistic studies. They study how the mask works. Like if I, if I put a fan on one side and I blow air through it and I measure what comes out on the other side, again, that's good information. We want to know how the mask, how, what percentage of particles the mask stops and what percentage it, le- it lets through. That's good information, but it doesn't tell us enough information to, to make it a panacea. And I no, think- that's right. Cause you don't know about the real like life effectiveness of it. And you don't know how many people will get infected. And gosh, it was just two days ago. I was looking at a kind of older study that was looking at influenza and influenza like illness. And they, yeah, they basically, the, the conclusion was that cloth masks were, were inferior to the control, <laughs> which was like, what it was a little bit of a weird, you know, conclusion. Um, but but we need studies like we would need studies like that with with COVID to figure out how many infections we're actually preventing, and we don't have any studies like that um, that I'm that I'm aware of. We just have like the large population based studies looking at mask mandates, and then we do have the the Danish study that that did that. Um, there were some limitations of that study, but basically they found no difference between the mask group and the, and the unmasked group, um, in, in terms of, of getting COVID as far as I remember, they weren't looking at giving COVID, but they were, you know, transmitting it. They were looking at, at, yeah, that's right. So they were only looking at getting it, but they didn't have information about how much the control arm was masking and they didn't have great information about the compliance. So I think that there were a few limitations of that study, but the, but the, the end result was there was no, there was no difference. Um, yeah, it's that's actually I think one of my bigger frustrations with you know with this tribe thing you mentioned earlier is I uh, I've been accused by many of being anti-mask. I'm not anti-mask. It's just that I know how they work. And and so I would prefer that if my county for example wants to make a mask mandate that they would post some of the readily available information to the public about which type of mask you're wearing and what type of situation it protects you in and which type it does not protect you in. Yeah, for it, sure. It, and for and sure. nobody's the, the health, the public health people are not doing that. They're just saying. Yeah, I, I know. I, I think, I mean, even uh, Michael Osterholm and Celine Gounder and stuff, they've been saying like, well, you know, cloth masks probably aren't really that effective. And I think that's kind of the information we've all been, a lot of us have been waiting to hear because certainly you know, when I was concerned about getting COVID, I wasn't vaccinated. I have a lot of older patients and I was like, um, you know, I don't, I, I would wear an N95, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I were concerned about getting or giving COVID, I wouldn't be wearing a cloth mask. Like, I, I don't know that that was nonsensical to me. I mean, we don't have the studies to say they, they do absolutely nothing, but I think we do need a little bit of sort of honesty about, well, you know, if you really want to be protected, you probably want to wear an N95 and not like a buff or something. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. something. Yeah. You can smell, if you can smell food through your mask, you're, yeah. you, can, you can breathe in aer- aerosols. 
Right, exactly. Um, and then you know, if it comes it, down to kids needing to wear N95s, then then we're in trouble because I don't see that being no. good. You, well, you you could tell me how how realistic that is, but I'm not seeing that. Right. Even my son already says we pull down the masks when the teachers aren't looking anyway. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. N95, it's going to be like what? No yep. way. <laughs> yep. No, it's it's. I think people underestimate uh, the, the how uncomfortable those can be when they're fit tested. Um, oh, yeah. but my goodness. Okay. So yeah. And I think that I'll, I'll, we'll wrap this up here in a minute, but the, um, that's again, one of my concerns, cause I do have students that are legitimately immunocompromised. They, as in, they had cancer in the last year and they've had chemo and there is no immune system. Uh, you know, it's just gone at which point, uh, you know, I concern, I'm concerned with the public health messaging that says just wear your mask masks work. Okay. Yeah, I, then, I, I agree with that. I know, yeah. I know. And then they think yeah. they're safe. And then their parents think they're safe sending them to school in a, you know, in a piece of cotton yeah. rather than fit. Cause if it's my kid who has just gone through chemo and I, and I feel like maybe socially he needs to be in school uh, and he, he can't do online school. He's got to be there. And, and because maybe he's having a mental breakdown or something, he's got to go to school fine, but I'm fit testing him in an N95 every single day. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and, and that's, but no one's telling them to do that. Right. I, I mean, and I wish that we could, for those kids, I just wish we had better guidelines about like, what is their actual risk and like, what can they, they sp- specifically those kids do, or even maybe those specific classrooms do in terms of improving ventilation. And, you know, I think we just need to be more creative and more like, uh, you know, in, in individualize with some of our responses and not every, every kid needs to wear an N95 for six hours a day. Like that just is like, that's not going to be practical yeah. or reasonable. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, okay, great. So this, you've been with me for an hour. I'm going to let you, let you go, but I do want to just say on, on the, on the way out, would, would you give some advice or some, maybe some key bits of, reminders to teachers who are going to be going back to school this week or already have, uh, regardless of whether or not they're in a masked school or a not masked school, um, how would you encourage us them to think about that environment? Absolutely. So, I mean, the number one thing right now is, is get vaccinated for teachers and staff and schools to get vaccinated. And, you know, I, I'm sure that most of them are. And once you are, you can really, you know, breathe a, a sigh of relief because if you get infected, it's very unlikely it's going to be a severe infection. There'll be a mild infection. And if you get a mild infection, if you get a case and, you know, you don't have any symptoms, it, you know, it's not a big problem, um, you know. And so, you know, it's I think we need to get used to the idea that we are probably all going to get infected. We may, you know, may or may not have symptoms from it. It's going to be a circulating virus. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of the kids there to remember that overall, like most kids are low risk. And if there's certain kids, you know, who are felt to be high risk in that classroom, you know, then, you know, to, to look into that, you know, ask, you know, maybe the parents can look in into that, but in, and like, especially high risk kids, adolescents, like they're good, good candidates for getting the vaccine. Um, but, um, and then, I mean, I guess I would say like, that not to focus on, on fear too much, I guess I feel like, you know, the, the amount of fear about what's going to happen once schools have, have opened, have, has been exaggerated. And, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to minimize it, but I, I found it interesting, you know, yesterday, it was a couple of days ago, I was reading the Danish newspaper and they said, you know, we've come to the terms with the fact that this isn't going to disappear and we're accepting a certain amount of, of viral spread in the schools. I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, you know, I mean, because they've just accepted like, you know, this is this is an illness that's going to be with us and kids are mildly affected generally. So um, but but yeah, I mean, uh, I think what else can I say? I guess that's, I, 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 I think that that's where I'll leave it and say, like, remember, you know, kids or kids really, you know, get so many benefits out of education and, and to kind of like focus on the good that you're doing and be reassured that, you know, in terms of your own health, like your vaccination is going to help you out is going to be your best friend. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tracy, so much for spending an hour with us. I really appreciate all the information and helping us unpack everything. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you, as always, for listening to an episode of the Coralosophy Podcast. It's been a while since I've done a full-length episode, and I think this was a good topic to get back into the game after a summer vacation for me. So I appreciate you sticking around to the end. And of course, if you made it this far, that means you probably got something out of it. Hopefully in this episode, you got a lot of good information uh, and a lot of good uh, armament against a school year where you are going to be back in the thick of things. And that was my goal today was to help you understand the situation that we are all walking into this next school year. And more importantly, the situation our kids are in since they seem to be in the middle of the conversation yet again. So if you did get something out of this episode and you appreciate the content, there are some huge ways that you can help. Number one, and the freest way, uh, is to simply share episodes. That's huge. It helps me beat the social media algorithm. actually saves me money when you share episodes. That's big. Liking, leaving ratings, leaving comments. Those are all great ways to hack the algorithm. And then, of course, you can join the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy for as little as $3 a month and jump into that supporter community over there. And then, of course, uh, there are great, great discounts for you at the five awesome vendors that uh, you see in the banner behind me on the YouTube channel, vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy for resonance and overtone software, sightreadingfactory.com for your sight reading instruction, graphite publishing and ryanmain.com for your online sheet music music purchasing needs and mymusicfolders.com for your resonance singers mask your choir folders your choir robes at mychoirrobes.com all of those websites take that coralosophy checkout code to give you and your school and your school budget a break with a discount code those are all ways that you can help out so thanks a lot and we'll see you next time